being with you this morning is a real pleasure. I'd like to give thanks to one of my dear friends and colleagues, Carrie McCaig, Dr. Carrie McCaig, who nominated me. Much of the work that I did was done um, when Carrie and I were working together at Regis University, and it's been wonderful to follow our careers as we have gone apart and diverged and come back together again. Today I'd like to talk about, go to my title here, Tiny Acts of Courage. And the title is chosen pretty deliberately. Someone said, I don't like that word. It, it feels so diminutive. And tiny acts of courage are just that, things that feel insignificant, things that feel like they don't really make a difference, but over the course of a lifetime and over the course of a career, make a difference in shaping you. Now, I come to you as an Air Force wife as opposed to an Air Force person. Um, they, I, I applied for the Air Force and they turned me down because I would have been in the same career field as my husband and they decided two of us in JAG at the same time was more than we needed. My husband retired um, from the Air Force and JAG um, after 22 years of service. So I spent about 12 years of, of his Air Force career doing that. And so part of what I bring to you today is some of that experience um, from uh, my life as both a Air Force wife and then retired. As we think about our small acts, though, these tiny decisions we make along the way shape who we are and the kind of person that we are going to become. Ethics is translating your values into action. And this is not a usual definition for, for ethics. We tend to think of ethics as being very personal. But the values that we hold both as an individual and in our communities are what makes a difference. And so we find out what our values are and then we act in accordance with those values. And as you all work through your various uh, professions, figuring out your core values, the organizational core values, and how those harmonize becomes the essence of our work together in ethics. Now, a lot of people start talking about values, and when I looked at them, there's a list of like 300 of them out there, and they are very confusing to me. I, I have a very simple mind that likes things in boxes. So when I began trying to sort them into boxes, I realized that values come in two flavors. One flavor is what are you going to do? I'm a team player, I'm diligent, I'm a risk player. But the other set of values are what kind of a person are you going to be? What often happens in our organizations is we reward the what to do sort of values. We reward people who get things done, we reward people who excel in their skills, but we often overlook people who as they are doing that are playing badly with others. They are not being kind, they are not being civil, they, we overlook sexual harassment, and all of those things. And so what we want to do, I want to have you think about, is how to make sure that both sides of who you are grows at the same time. Having done this work in leadership and ethics for a very long time, I believe that you cannot proceed any farther in leadership than you can in ethical maturity. And if your ethical maturity does not keep up with your leadership skills, you will stall out and flame out and burn. And so this is a very important developmental task that we have ahead of us. Now these are four icons, and I know that some of you are coming here out of your philosophy classes. Each one of those pictures represents a school of thought that has 5,000 years of history. And what philosophy does is teach us to think in ethics about what kind of a person do I want to become? And so we're going to spend some time with each of these theories, taking a look at what they teach us about what kind of a person we want to be. And each of these theories has a positive side that brings us forward, as well as a shadow side. So we're going to look at both sides of the equation. So as we begin, the first question we ask is what principles are important to us? As human beings, we have intention, our head, the rules, the principles, and our heart, the feelings, the emotion, and the caring. And so in ethics, we have this perpetual tension between our head and our heart. What, is, what are we supposed to do? And then how does that fit with how we fit with human beings? So the story I'd like to talk about is the fact that our choice can define our life. And this is a story of shattered expectations. The person, the person who shared with me this story retired from the Navy, his name is Mark, and he tells the story of graduating from Annapolis and going off to his first assignment as a brand new young Navy ensign, would that maybe be the right title? Uh, yeah, I got it, I'm always so excited when I get the titles right. And he said that he, would, he went, and Friday afternoon, everybody shut down shop at three and went off to the officer's club. And there, 
people expected him to behave and to do things that he was never taught to do growing up. He was never taught to do in, in the Naval Academy. And the choice he had to make was, do I go along with my senior officers who are engaging in these behaviors, or do I not? How do I make sure that I'm accepted, not derail my career the first you know, two weeks I'm out of, out of the academy, but at the same time live into who I am at my best? And Mark said that what he did is he thought about it, he reflected on it, and decided that he was not going to rock the boat, no pun intended, well, actually the pun was intended, um, but he, he would not call anybody out. He would not make a big deal about it. He just would not participate. And so as they began to do activities that he disagreed with or found to be outside, you know, things like excess drinking, excess partying. I mean, this, this story was before tail hook, before you had the whole change of culture in the Navy. He would just excuse himself. And he would not hang for the sake of hanging. And so as you all go at various times in your career and you move into a new culture with new sets of expectations, you have to make that decision about what of this matches who I am, which of this brings out the best of who I am, and which of this does not reflect what I want to be or my organization to be. And you can make those tiny decisions about what to, how to participate, when to call somebody out on a joke, when to not go along with the crowd, and when to take a stand. And so these very beginning decisions are the ones that will make a difference in your life. What are the principles you live into? And how do those fold into your life in your career? The next one is, what do I care about? So your principles are your head, and your heart is what's important to you. And how do you find out what your career is going to be? One of the reasons I love teaching college was that people were working with what they wanted to do for their rest of their lives and make a difference. Now, I'm also starting to work with 45-year-olds who are now, what am I going to do with the second half of my life? But what do I care about? And the example that I'd like to share with you today is the case of the sleeping pheasant. I have a good friend whose name is Rex. He actually does all the programming in our company. And Rex does, um, goes out and does pheasant hunting and trains dogs to uh, run and catch pheasants. And he's a gunner. He works a lot with training military folks in terms of um, firearm safety and all the rest of that. So he was out on a trial last spring, and the dog that was running the course did not flush out the pheasant. And Rex ran into the pheasant, and he had to make a decision in the split second about whether he was going to flush the pheasant, kill it, and let the dog retrieve it. Now, he said the dog had already lost, so there was no point. And he made the decision not to flush the pheasant. And I said, well, that." He said, but it was really weird. I said, how did you make that decision? He said, I'd had hours of conversation with my colleagues about the ethics of running these particular games. We talk about what do we do as gunners? What do we do as judges? What do we do when we train our dogs? And as we talk together in this, we shape the culture of people who participate in this particular sport. And so the lesson I'd like you to think about is as you talk with each other, you shape the culture of your organization. You shape where you are in, you, in your um, world. And lots of times, people don't want to say anything because they're going against other people, or maybe people aren't going to agree. And yet, if we don't speak up and add our voice into the mix, you don't get the whole you don't, of the conversation that is needed. And so as we begin to think about what's important, something as small as what we do for recreation, can shape the expectations about what it means to be in community. And so critical thinking, we all talk about that at the academic level, critical thinking is bringing your voice into the mix, testing it, does this work, and being willing to have your mind changed and shaped. Now the reason that this is really important is that Rex didn't ever think about when he was going to be flushing out a bird. Those conversations happened along the way. And in the military, you wind up with situations you don't expect, and if you haven't thought about it first, if you haven't had the conversations first, you don't know what to do. And so again, participating in conversations to figure out your heart's desire and to figure out how you want to fit and what the edges are of acceptable behavior becomes a really important part of ethics. What are my principles? What do I care about? These are the two individual sides of ethics as we begin to think about it. The next thing we do then is move to the community side. What kind of a community do I want to be in? 
And this conversation is between the individuals we figure out who we are and our gifts and the community that we're part of as we figure out where we're called to be. Now, I tell people it was very lucky that I was not called to be a person who wore a blue uniform. My husband said I'd never survive OTS because I don't like following rules very well. And anytime someone tells me to do something, my first question is why? I never outgrew that five-year-old tendency. Uh, makes me a really great academic, by the way, but not so wonderful there. And so as I think about the communities in which I've participated, how do I as an individual fit and how do I shape? And the course, the, the story I'd like to tell you about this one is a story from my husband. I met him in law school. He'd already been an Air Force officer for some uh, 10 years and he took excess leave to go to law school. And one of the stories he told me about was his life in Vietnam. He was an ordnance disposal officer, took part bombs. I was very glad I did not know him then. And he was in Nam during the Tet Offensive doing ordnance disposal. And he said that one of the things he decided when he was there is that he would not put his troops at risk if unnecessarily. And what he knew from watching and from history was that the last 30 days on an assignment in a battlefield is where you make stupid mistakes. And so for the last 30 days, all of his troops were assigned to a desk unless absolutely necessary. And even though they complained they wanted to be part of the action, that was the decision he made. But that seemingly small decision was not a, a random act. It came out of an entire lifetime of caring for his troops. Bob grew up during the Civil Rights Movement and he became an Air Force officer because the opportunities for African Americans in the wider society in, in mid-60s was limited. And the Air Force provided an opportunity for him to grow and to thrive. And after he went through OTS, one of his very first assignments was to uh, Robbins Air Force Base in Warner Robins, Georgia. And this is mid to late 60s. I should have asked him this morning when it was, but mid to late 60s. And he goes into Warner Robins and it's completely segregated. Coloreds, whites, drinking fountains, restaurants. And he became incensed. So he went to his commanding officer and said, sir, respectfully, sir, what are you doing as a commander of this base to get rid of these degradations that our troops, our people, have to face in Warner Robins? What are you doing as a major employer in this community to make sure that our troops of color are treated fairly? And the commanding officers, you can imagine, sort of looked at this young upstart like, what in the world? He was transferred to Pease three months later. <laughs> turned out not to be a barrier to his career, but it set the tone as a young captain about what he was going to stand up for. And so no matter where we are in our career, I invite you to do some soul searching about what it is that you will stand up for. What is it that even if you're way out of rank and you feel like you don't have a voice, what is it that you will stand up for? I know in talking to my to colleagues who talk, uh, teach ethics in, in the military where you have one side of the equation where you salute smartly and you follow orders and you do it because that discipline is so important. The other half of the equation is asking questions. Is this in fact a legitimate order? Is this in fact necessary now? And learning how to do that questioning respectfully is part and parcel of what is required to be a good officer and a good enlisted person. And so balancing that between myself and my others as you begin to move forward is critical. And then Bob taught me that one of the keynotes, one of the hallmarks of any officer and the ones that I respected were those who cared for their people. And they made sure that their troops were cared for and protected to the degree possible. Now he held them accountable, mind you. I mean, I remember one time when they spent three weeks going through every file in the JAG office making sure the paper clips were squared because they were getting ready for an IG. I didn't understand that, but they passed. But, this is the kind of place that you make a difference when you begin thinking about it. Okay, and then the last question that we ask is what is my role? Each of us as we move into our community have varying roles that we take on. And so the story that I talk about this is the story of true love. I was contacted about six months ago by a Navy chaplain who was doing ethics training for her, her group out um, on the west coast somewhere. And one of the questions that they had and the question that we put together for their ethics training is what do you do when you have a strict rule against fraternization? People are out, they fall in love, 
They try to hide it, and then they come to you and want you to support the relationship and not tell anybody. At what point, you know, how do you coach them into true love might be important, but you have rules to follow? How do you decide when it is you're going to bring forward this information? And so part of the decision in every situation is different, but I invite you to think about when you are faced with people who you care about, who are not following the best practices of, your, of the military, who are not following what they are supposed to do. Do you support them in insubordination? Do you coach them? And how do you coach them into becoming back in alignment with the goals and the behaviors that are expected of them? And then when do you move it forward? And this is the greatest problem because you have people who put personal loyalty ahead of loyalty to the organization. Now, it's not just in the military. It happens in every organization. If, you've, if you're in a management class and you study Enron, you had people who put Enron ahead of, of um, personal loyalty to the leadership ahead of the rules. And so it's not endemic just here. It's a human question that we have to ask as we are in organizations. At what times do the organizations take priority over our loyalty to our friends? And I would submit that this particular time in our history is a time we are asking that question with great urgency as we think about the organizations that are near and dear to us. So you start with the bright side, my core values. What are my principles? What do I care about? What kind of a community do I want to be part of? What is my role and what am I called to do in that role? And we figure out what our core values and commitments are. But every one of us in this room has a shadow side, and every one of us has a place where we can be tempted. Each of those four values, by the way, those four quadrants, is one of them is your home quadrant. And one of those will let you know what your blind spots are. And so as our, as our cautionary tale for blind spots, I would like to bring up Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. This is Dr. Larry Nasser. Over the past two years, I've been privileged to go to uh, Michigan State University and work with their business students to sort of untangle what went wrong at Michigan State. For those of you who may not know Dr. Nasser, he was a gymnastics um, doc coach, doctor. He was actually the, the, the doctor, and he was, had this amazing therapy. Well, the amazing therapy he had was sexually assaulting the young women. And for something like 20 years, I believe it went on, um, hundreds and hundreds of young women were sexually assaulted by him under the guise of medical treatment. And the question that Med Michigan State is asking is, how could that have happened for so long? And so as I began exploring the shadow side of us as human beings, some, some um, possibilities came to light. The first one is leveraging the power of fear. He was able to work with every constituent around their core fear. The gymnast's fear of losing, the university's fear of losing status, his peers' fear of not being well ranked, his colleagues' fear of calling him out when it wasn't appropriate. And so the blind side of leadership, and the question that we ask as leaders is, are you going to leverage fear, or are you going to use your power appropriately? And as soon as you move into fear, I would submit that you are moving now into the ethical blind spots and a misuse of power. So those of us who live in the results lens, and for those of you who are philosophy majors or in your philosophy classes, this is the school of thought known as consequentialism or utilitarianism. The question that is asked out of this theory is, what do I want to accomplish as a person? What are the goals that I want to achieve? And so what happens in the blind spot is you make choices that are personally advantageous as opposed to moderating your own desires as you seek the goals. And so as we began to take apart Michigan State, we realized that the coaches did not want to report the misconduct because they didn't want to jeopardize their young women's success. One of the stories that was told was a coach who was getting ready to go to the Olympics. And he found out about the misconduct about nine months before the Olympics. And he knew that gymnastics is highly subjective and he feared that if he blew the whistle on Nasser, that, they would, that the judges would retaliate against his gymnasts, and women who had worked for a lifetime to get to the Olympics would be denied that opportunity. So he made the decision to not report it until two months after the Olympics. 
And in the process, they figured another 30 to 40 young women were sexually assaulted in that period of time between. Now, he put barriers in place. His women were not allowed to be with him, with Nasser. He made sure that those that he was responsible for were protected. But he had others outside of his control who fell in. And so the question becomes, how do you balance fear of retribution, personal goals, against bringing to the fore behavior that is inappropriate and criminal? The responsibilities lens falls into the um, body of thought that we think about as deontology. For people who live in this lens, therefore, the, the major word they say is duty. What are my, what's my duty and what are my principles? And because they're focused on duties, they have two blind spots. The first blind spot is that they rationalize why they don't follow the rules. There's a whole good reason why these rules don't apply to me, and I don't have to follow them. And then the second thing they do is they use people as means to their ends. One of the things we talk about, I know, I know you talk about at the academy, is respect for others as a core, core belief and a core philosophy. And respect for others means respecting them as human beings, not as means to your ends. Knowing that they have choices and they get to make decisions about how they are going to live. So in this particular case, what happened is all of the clubs had rules about gift giving. Now those of us who work in organizations sometimes find that there's a whole bunch of what we consider really stupid rules around conflict of interest and gifts and what we're going to do and people figure out how to go around them. I had a stint where I worked with a, a Colorado legislature in the Secretary of State's office and we were rewriting the election laws. And the question was, what is the limits for gifts for a legislator? And the limit, by the way, is the price of a Broncos ticket. Because there it is. <laughs> and not, not down the south stands either. <laughs> so um, what happened is that people would uh, report that things were going on and then there would be these gifts. And so what Nasser did is that the women had very strict rules about what they could eat because they had to maintain their weight. And he would go, darling, I know it's OK. Or, it's, have a Skittle. Have a little treat. And so he would give the women these little bitty gifts, at which point then they thought he was their friend. And then when there was a sexual assault that came under the guise of a treatment, they, they had the disconnect because how could this person who's our friend also be saying, also be doing this behavior. And the clubs then didn't do it. He was able to treat the women in his home. So there was a rule that you sh cannot do any treatments in your home. He set up a clinic in his basement um, and was treating women there. And the thing that was the most amazing is, and you just sort of wonder about how a person does this, but he would be doing a treatment, sexually assaulting a young woman, and the mother would be standing right at the head, talking to, talking to the young woman and talking to him and you realize that someone who is like that, um, there's nothing we can do other than put protections in place. And so these rules that we have are there to make sure that when you get someone for whom shame is, doesn't mean anything and they're doing this for a game, that those protections are in place. Okay, we then go to the relationship lens. And the relationship lens has as its keyword fair. And so for those of you who are following along in our philosophy theories, this one is the justice lens and it cares about things like social contract. Those of you who care about sustainability would live up there. Those of you who care about environmentalism would find a home there. My dear friend Terry lives in this lens. Um, every other word she does is fair. And so when she and I were teaching together, I'd say, well, here's what we need to accomplish. And she'd go, but is it fair? And so we know this. Um, what happened for the university is that they cared about, their, about themselves and they didn't follow their own processes. Every university, Air Force Academy is like, it has a process for, for processing sexual assault claims. They have a way of working through it. Uh, the federal government has given us guidelines about what that looks like and uh, Michigan State did not follow its own processes. They believed that they were exempt from them, that they somehow knew better. And so the ethical blind spot that goes with this particular lens is the blind spot of knowing we have processes in place for everybody else, but we don't have to follow them. Now, I live in the results lens, and so I, I chafe processes. I'm getting to, ready to do some research, and one of my colleagues said, well, what about um, going to your research, your institution, and making sure that you do your human subjects evaluation form? I 
that's completely the wrong word, shows how much I'm into process. And it's like, okay, fine, we will do this, we respect the process, they're here for reasons, and then begin to move. The voice is to change the process. If the process doesn't work, the option is not to not follow the process. So what they did is they um, did not have an independent Title IX investigation. This was also the law, law, lawyer's fault. They had a law firm that represented them, and the law firm also then did the Title IX, which meant that they were not an independent voice. And so they got something like $5.3 million for doing these two things, but the whole process was to make sure that the school was not liable. Um, the other piece that happened is that as Nasser was publishing these things, nobody was holding him accountable for the research. So his peers evaluating his work was going, you know, this doesn't feel right. But rather than speak up, they kept silent. So remember what I talked about that gift back a little bit ago, about speaking up when something doesn't feel quite right? Um, that's where we challenge each other to hold each other accountable if things don't work well. And then the direct supervisors exempted him from the processes. He didn't have to follow the product protocols because he was so special. The last ethical lens then is a reputation lens. This is the virtue ethics place. This is where members of the community come together to determine what is best for people in the role. So as you guys, all, I love the Air Force. You do training and then you work and training you work. And in each of those training areas, you learn what is required in that role, what is required for me as I do this work. USA Gymnastics is the keeper of, or was the keeper, of all of these records. And what they did is if they got someone who complained about a coach being inappropriate or a member of the team being inappropriate, they filed it and they moved them to another location. So lest you think the Catholic Church is the only people who do this, organizations everywhere do. And I would be willing to bet that, that there have been people in blue who have been transferred from bad spots where they were misbehaved to another spots, hoping their reputation didn't follow them. And so what they wound up doing is they did not keep an up-to-date list of the coaches or the support team that had allegations. And then they didn't follow up on any of the abuses. Again, the goal was to protect elite programs. The goal was to protect elite folks. And so out of this, you notice that we have Nassar, who's a bad actor, and nobody's going to defend him. But in each of these four squares, we have people of goodwill, people who would consider themselves ethical, people who would consider themselves with the best interest of gymnastics in Michigan State at their heart, who found themselves as bit players in this drama that led to a massive scandal, many, many women being hurt, and Michigan State now fighting for its recognition. And last I read, USA Gymnastics had been decertified. I, think, I don't think they're in the middle of appealing that, but they lost their certification. And so each of us, as we are living in our organizations and our worlds, have to say, where do we, because of our own goals for pride, our own desires, where can we be tempted into having not our best self show up? Where can we be tempted to do something that will cause either us or our organization to fail in terms of its ethical mission? And that requires tiny acts. None of those people in the ancillary did things that you and I would consider just terribly bad things to do. But the, the aggregate of them together led to hundreds of women being sexually assaulted. So what happened is we began to notice, we as a community have begun to pay attention, and we have noticed that ha what has happened out of this is a movement of awareness about this particular brand of bad behavior. Now I'm old enough to know that bad behavior goes in and out of fashion. And so you'll have a period of time where we're focusing on sexual assault. You'll have another period of time where we're focusing on conflict of interest. You have another period of time where we're focusing on abuse of power. And so part of what you're going to be asked to do is to watch to see what's emerging in your lives. Because all of this is hindsight. Moving forward, those abuses are not as obvious. Now one of the things that always becomes important, and this is a marvelous example, is what was called a pyramid of hate, and this comes from one of Carrie and my students, uses this in her work. But you'll notice at the very bottom, and you probably can't read it very well, but it says, accepting stereotypes and not challenging, 
belittling jokes, scapegoating, assigning blame to people because of their group identity. Each one of us in this room has the ability to speak up when something like that happens. Each one of us in this room has the ability to monitor our own speech and monitor our own thoughts to make sure that we don't inadvertently fall into that particular pattern. And then you move into acts of prejudice, name calling, ridicule, social avoidance. Many of my d d dilemmas in our, for, that our company does has to do with bullying online. What do you do when people post things that are not true, when they go on a little rampage? Um, one of the organizations that I'm with, the executive director put a message out to the members of the board this week that one of our former volunteers was upset with a decision he made and is now spreading everything out on social media and what do we do? And so as we begin to think about how we counter this and how we use our own words um, as we're in social media it becomes so important. Um, people who follow me on, on, online know that I'm passionate about three or four things. And yet, as I post, I'm very, very careful to focus on the ideas and not the person, to make sure that what I do is, is fact check. My husband, bless his heart, posts junk out there, and I said, did you fact check this? Well, no, I fact check it, dude. You know, <laughs> go and do a hot minute of research before you put something out there with your name on it and begin to think. We then move into discrimination, violence, and genocide. And so again, the pyramid of hate starts with tiny acts tiny acts that you and I can participate in. So the Me Too movement started. There's a voice. But the question always comes, what about false accusations? My husband's first assignment as my, my first assignment as an Air Force wife was at Pete Field, just down the street from here. And I was an attorney, not accepting the Air Force, which was God's gift. And so I started practicing law. And I had a practice here. And one of the cases that I had was a young troop from Fort Carson. And he had, been a he had been charged with rape. And so he came to me to defend him. Now, many people will say, Catherine, you're a woman. Why would you ever defend a man against rape? And I would say the purpose of a defense lawyer is to find the truth and, if, and to make sure that the very best outcome happens. So I started poking around to figure out. And the reason my little spidey sense went up was because the woman, who was also in the Army, said that she had been raped in the front seat of a Volkswagen Rabbit. Now, I knew enough about Volkswagen Rabbits to know that one could not be raped in the front seat of a Volkswagen Rabbit without bruises in your back. And she had no bruises anywhere on her body. But the question that is always asked is, why would anybody lie? Why would someone make this up if it didn't really happen? And what we found out when we started poking, when I started poking, was that her mother was critically ill and she had asked for a compassionate transfer from Fort Carson to a base close to her mom's house. And the Army, in its infinite wisdom, decided that that was an insufficient reason for a transfer. But the rules also provided that if you were a victim of a sexual assault, you got transferred anywhere you wanted. And so what she did is she managed to get herself a sexual assault claim so she could get transferred to her mom's, shop, mom's house and by base by there. The only reason I was able to crack that case was because a young captain was as committed to finding the truth as I was. And when I went to him on base to say, you know, what are the rules and what are the processes and what's going on that maybe will make it, he was willing to talk to me and did not put a curtain of silence around what was going on. And so we all have mixed motives. We all have reasons why we may or might not um, always live into our best selves. And it's the task of all of us to begin to figure it out. By the way, um, he was acquitted. He went back and had a career. She devolved terribly. She had a mental breakdown, a physical breakdown, and had a dishonorable discharge. Um, and so we moved on. But the goal is always our best self as we move forward. Kwame Appiah is one of my very favorite philosophers. He's up at, in Harvard, and he talks about changes. And he talks about times when there's these massive changes in the community. He does work around slavery, uh, women getting the vote, foot binding, dueling. And I think you and I are in the middle of one of those massive changes right now around human rights and um, understandings. And we're also in a, hu a massive change around our understanding of our planet and how we're going to be and work on our planet. And so as each of you are thinking about where you are in this moment of time, it is really easy not to notice the huge changes going on. 
And yet each of us, by the tiny decisions we make, will shape the way that trajectory of change that we are going to take both as a nation, that you guys will take in your career fields, and that all of us take in the work that we do together. So what I'd like to leave you with today is the fact that your identity, your values, and your choices are the three items that contribute to your ethical self. And each one of us in this room has an ethical self. It asks to be recognized and to be nurtured, and it grows with us as we mature in our careers. The problem that we have with it is that for many of us, it is not at a level of thinking. When people talk to me about following their gut, what they're following is things that they had in childhood, decisions they made about how to make sure their parents didn't kill them. It's our first function as human beings, you know, is to make sure your mother loves you enough to feed you. Um, we create our sense of self over time. It is very fragile. Any of you who have ever coached someone who's behaving badly know that they go first into fence, then into denial, and then to work with someone to have them come into their best self becomes difficult. And you and I have lots of strategies to keep us from telling the truth about ourselves. But the greatest gift you can give yourself is the ability to look at yourself as clearly as possible, gently, kindly, but clearly. And when you listen to Dr. Brene Brown today, I know that her message resonates with that in terms of how do you transform and grow compassionately, but clearly. And then change beliefs and change behaviors as needed. So I ask you, and I ask you to spend some time thinking about this. What are your core values and commitments? But make friends with your shadow side. Make friends with that side of you that is not always your best. And that will stand you in good sense, because your shadow side will give you early warnings when you're about to do something really, really stupid that you don't necessarily want to do. I want to leave some time for questions, so thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your day.